All right, Biology 11 students, our topic today, as you can see, is speciation, which is basically making branches on the tree of life. All right, Darwin referred to all living things stemming from one ancestral species, and it gave rise to a whole bunch of branches. Today, we're going to talk about how those branches are formed, um, and that branching is actually called speciation. That's the scientific term for it. So let's get into it. Speciation is a formation of new species due to selective pressures, right? And so that's what it is. When we see one ancestral species giving rise to two different species, this is speciation. And you can see how a tree would be full of little branching patterns like that. Now, in our last lecture, we looked at disruptive selection pressure. Right? We know selection pressure is that invisible force that you can feel. You can definitely feel it, even though it's invisible. That invisible force that Mother Nature places upon creatures to survive. It's, it's part of her checklist every day, right? And so if you remember with our hummingbirds, we looked at their beak length and we compared it to the flowers. Right? We said the flowers were the, the thing in the environment that you know, would have an effect on the length of the hummingbird beak. There were small, medium, and long beaked hummingbirds. And we said the majority of the population were medium because in our you know, hypothetical environment, most of the flowers are medium length, and that was it. Disruptive selection, if you remember, is a hard selective pressure against the current population norm. And who gets favorited, or who gets selected for, are both the extreme forms of the trait. So with the hummingbird beaks, what would happen is our original population, the black line here, was mainly medium. Disruptive selection pressure starts. This medium length bird is selected against heavily by mother nature. Life becomes an incredible grind. And meanwhile, the short and long beaked hummingbirds start to thrive. Things open up for them and life becomes easier for them. So the result of that is a population looks more like this with very little middle ground. The mediums are almost entirely gone. The long and short length beak hummingbirds are now growing in numbers to the point where short beaks only mate with other short beaks and long beaks only mate with other long beaks. And when they stop freely interbreeding, that's when we have that fork in the road. These guys have become their own species, the short-beaked hummingbirds. These guys have become the long-beaked hummingbird species. And we actually see that in birds, the short-beaked this and the long-beaked that. I mentioned that last uh, lecture, I believe. So that's it. They no longer recognize each other, so they don't freely interbreed. And when they stop that, they stop being part of the same species. Changes in gene frequency, right, if you think... Medium genes are now being replaced in the population by short and long genes. And the phenotypic traits would also mirror that. Phenotype, if you remember from genetics, is what you're going to see. Well, I did see a whole bunch of medium beaks get replaced over time by small and large beaks. Uh, within a single population, like hummingbirds and flowers, right? So the hummingbirds changed. Well, did the hawks? Did the swans? Did the dogs? Did the people? No, nothing else just our hummingbirds and our flowers. So only a couple of species, right? The flowers changed, the hummingbirds changed. Didn't bother the turtles, didn't bother mosquitoes, didn't bother fungi or anything else there. Just a, you know, one, two, three species involved. That is termed microevolution. You can see it here on the, on the iPad. Microevolution means evolution occurred, but it was very localized with a small number of species, our hummingbirds and our, and our flowers. Lots of other things weren't. Now, if an asteroid were to smash into the planet and greatly change the environment overall, that would impact all species, right? All species on a continent or in the entire planet, perhaps. That is macroevolution. So we've seen both events. Microevolution like this occurs all the time. And macroevolution hasn't occurred, thankfully. Um, some may say climate change is doing that, macroevolution. But macroevolution is back in the days of the dinosaurs when uh, biologists and scientists believe that an asteroid impacted the Earth and greatly changed the environment.
making everyone have to adapt or die. So microevolution, speciation is a good example of that. So to recap, what is a species? If you remember what a species is, there's a species is a group within the population that has three things the same. They are physically similar or physiologically similar, so they look the same. The second thing, they freely interbreed. All right, our hummingbirds stopped doing this. That's why they became separate species. And the third thing they have to do is have offspring that are fertile. So their offspring are fertile, which means their kids can have kids themselves one day when they become adults, right? They can continue the species. We talked about a, a horse and a donkey. They do look physically the same. They will freely interbreed, but their offspring, the mule, can't have kids. They'll never be a mommy or daddy mule, all right? So if all three of these things you can check off, you are part of the same species. If one of these things isn't the same with you and the other creature, then you're a different species. All right, so how do we keep species separate? Because when speciation occurs, right, we've seen this over and over again. Here's our ancestor. And here's species A and species B. They've formed from this ancestral species the common ancestor to both of these things. Now, once we see the branching, we never see this, right? These guys can keep branching, but we never see them go back together like that. They never fuse back together and form one again. It's always branching, 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 branching. There's no fusion or going back together, right? So A and B don't come and form C. It doesn't work that way. We've never seen that. What can happen again, is population A can, later on down the line, because this is time, so this is ancient time and more modern time, A can split and form population C, and B can form population D. And then there can be another split later on, right? Population E comes off of those. So we can see lots of branches, but they never fuse back together. Why don't they fuse back together? Why can't they split and then eventually come back together, especially if they're in the same environment, experiencing the same conditions of the same checklist from Mother Nature. Well, what there is in nature are species isolating mechanisms. And basically this is any behavioral, structural, or biochemical trait or thing about you that prevents individuals from diff of different species from reproducing successfully together. So it could be a, a behavioral thing like an action it could be a structural thing, like a part of your body, or a biochemical thing. That's kind of like the physiology part of, of, of life, the chemicals that are involved. And it doesn't allow two different things to come together and form a new species, to form a single species from two different species. So when we talk about reproductive isolating mechanisms, we talk about prezygotic. and post-zygotic. Pre means before. So these are isolating mechanisms that will not let a zygote, no zygote is formed, it stops the process before that. So sperm and egg aren't even, they're not even getting together here because we know that a zygote is the, pro, you know, it's a product of a, an egg and a sperm cell getting together. That's not happening with these. Postzygotic means the zygote was formed, but something after that stops the line. All right, so that's the difference between the two. One is no zygote is ever formed. The other one is the zygote forms, but something after it will stop the line. So the first ones we're going to look at are prezygotic, and that point just kind of goes back to before and after a zygote being formed. So prezygotic mechanisms, all right? These are ones that do not allow for actual mating to occur because mating would lead to 
a potential zygote being formed. Or fertilization can occur, which means a zygote would be formed. So we stop that. So the first one is ecological isolation. Right? Ecological means the two species live in different habitats. I may have two herons. Herons are those long-legged birds that you see up at Lake Snad around Ontario. One of them lives in Ontario. The other one lives in Spain. Well, these two birds are never getting together. Even though the one in the lakes of Ontario looks remarkably a lot like the ones in the lakes of Spain, same coloration, same height, they look like the exact same bird, the two species never have the chance. They're way too far apart, right? And it doesn't count if man captures them and forces them into a room and says, you two mate. That's not it. Remember, it's naturally interbreeding, not forced interbreeding by man. So in nature, they never have the opportunity to meet each other. Another species isolating mechanism is temporal isolation. That's where you have different reproductive timing. So you might have um, two species of skunks, right? They're both black with the white lines. They look, well, that skunk looks a lot like that skunk. But a lot of animals in the wild have a reproductive timing involved in their life cycle, which means the door for breeding and producing offspring, or at least fertilizing eggs, is only a few weeks or a month or whatever. There's a, there's a mating season, right? And then after that, it all shuts down. There's no mating season. Part of that is you don't want creatures to mate at one point of the year where it's great and then give birth to offspring in the middle of our harsh Canadian winter, which would, you know, surely do them in, kill a lot of them. So a lot of animals, they mate um, later on in, their, in the nice times and so that the females are pregnant during the winter and the offspring are given birth to in the spring, right? Then they can live, you know, they can learn how to survive during the, the more pleasant spring and summertime. So in temporal isolation, you might have species A, right, temporal, is all about timing. So species A says, hey, it's April. It's time to mate. And so this, you know, if we were talking about skunks, skunk from species A says, it's April. It's time to mate. We have to make offspring. Species B might say, wait a second. We don't do that until August. You are way early, right? So when one species is ready to mate, the other one says, nope. Everyone that wants to mate in April is part of that species. Everyone that wants to mate in August is part of the other one. And that's what keeps them separate and isolated. A's and B's separate. There's also behavioral isolation. Behavioral isolation goes back to rituals or actions used to recognize a suitable mate. If remember, behavioral isolation is often linked to sexual selection. So behavioral isolation, we see this in a lot of species that practice sexual selection. Now, if you remember sexual selection, that can be like dances, it could be, you know, a certain call is made or a noise. It could be um, a certain display of feathers, right? So there's different things. We said birds do this a lot, right? Lots of species do it. Could come down to fighting. So in behavioral selection, you may have two species of bird, right? You have mate bird A and bird B. Bird B is out here and they're doing all of this stuff. They're dancing, calling out, you know, tweeting, hooting, whatever they're doing, and they're going on like, like a total nut. All of this stuff making noise, and species A is going like, you know, species A is going like, why in the heck? What is, like, why is he doing that? What a moron, right? So that's behavioral isolation. Now, if there were another member of species B around, they would be like, oh my God, look at him dance. Look at, listen to what he's saying. Oh my God, the display, look at his clothing. And they'll fall in love, right? There's a poorly drawn heart to prove that. But they'll fall in love because they're part of the same species. They recognize that behavior, right? And she'll go, oh my God, he's just the best ever. Meanwhile, the female of species A is just like, I have no idea what's going on here. I'm getting out of here. That fool's going to attract predators. And that's bad news, right? 
mechanical isolation. Mechanical isolation just, well, a mechanic deals with parts of things, and that's basically it. The reproductive parts of the body can only function or be used in the presence of another of the same species. So for example, an elephant and a mouse, they cannot mate. It's not going to work. All right, you can, you, 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 I don't have to explain why that one wouldn't work. But a really cool one that I saw, and I actually found a picture of it for later on, there's two different snails found in the intertidal zone. Now the intertidal zone is the area on the shoreline that is between the low tide mark and the high tide mark. So there's snails that live here and they're called whelks. So a whelk is basically, a, it's a snail. Oh God, that's, it's basically a snail. And there's a couple of different species of whelks living in the area on the shore between the high tide and the low tide. And Dr. Durante, who, who did marine ecology in Cape Breton, she showed us how they look the same, all of these whelks, but there's actually two different species. And so she picked two of them up and said, do they, you know, do they look like they'd be the same species? The coloration was the same. They had a shell, obviously. They were the same size. And I was like, yeah, that, I, I would believe that they'd be two of the same species. And then she held the two shells together and said, look, see how they don't fit like a puzzle? And me never seen, you know, having seen the, I've seen the whelks before, but never really done that with them, put them together. But, oh yeah, they, they sort of look the same, but they won't fit together. She reached out, grabbed another one and said, look at these two. And they fit together like puzzle pieces, the two openings of the shell. She goes, these are two of the same species. These snails can now mate because of that. And so even though they looked remarkably alike, they had different physical structures and that's mechanical isolation. And then there's gametic isolation, right? We see this in a lot of marine organisms. So fish will be in the water. So here's our water. And here's our bottom of the water, the, the seabed or the lake bed, if it's fresh water. And you'll have different species of females lay their eggs. So species A has the red eggs. Species B has the black eggs. And then you have species C, which has the blue eggs. And so these can be three different species, either in the open ocean or in a lake or a stream or whatever. And they lay their eggs in little deposits along the bottom. So if a male, the females swim away afterwards, right? They don't, they drop the eggs and they're gone. So if a, that's a pretty good looking fish. I'm pretty impressed with that. So if a fish comes along, I'm really impressed. We'll even put a little dorsal fin on. If a fish comes along and this fish is from species B, he releases sperm cells into the water. Now, those sperm cells are going to recognize, obviously, if he's B, they'll recognize the eggs from the female of species B. So if one of these little sperm cells and one of these eggs meet, we'll get a zygote. But if one of these sperm cells goes up, right? So species B sperm cell, sperm cell meets up with egg from species C, there's no match. They can't fertilize each other. Same thing over here. If some of a sperm from species B comes over to the eggs from species A, they won't meet up. There's biochemical markers on the outside of the sperm and the eggs that match up like a key in a lock. B and B works. The B key will open up the B lock, but it won't open up the C lock or the A lock. So there's no fertilization here. There will be here. And that's gametic isolation. All right. Now, postzygotic mechanisms are ones, if you think about it, a zygote is formed and the isolation takes place after. All right. So all of those ones that we just covered, no zygote is formed whatsoever. Now we have a zygote that is a produced and now we've got to do something after the fact. The first one is zygotic mortality, which means the zygote is made 
So the sperm cell reaches the egg and we end up with the zygote. But what happens in zygotic mortality, and mortality means death, is that during prenatal development, this zygote is going to die. All right? So it gets, you know, if the, if the prenatal length of time is three months, maybe after month one, the zygote dies. It doesn't develop properly. Right? The second type of postzygotic isolating mechanisms is hybrid inviability. And what that means is the zygote develops into a full offspring. So a baby, if you want to call it that, and the baby is born or hatches or whatever it happens to be, you know, however it's brought into the world. But as soon as it's, you know, born or hatches, it dies. V is life. In means not, right? So inviable means not able to live. So the hybrid develops prenatally. You think everything is fine. The offspring is born and then dies shortly thereafter. And then there's hybrid infertility. So now the baby becomes an adult, right? The baby is born, it lives, it's strong, it's good, it's eating, it's drinking water, it's growing, things are great. But that adult is sterile. It can't have kids of its own. It can't produce functioning sperm cells or egg cells. This is our mule, right? The donkey and the horse can mate. Whoever gives a sperm and the egg, it doesn't matter. But the donkey and the horse mate. The zygote is formed. Everything's fine. The zygote develops in, inside of the parent, the mother. The little mule is given birth to. It grows. Everything is fine. But it will never be a parent itself. Right? A single tear rolls down my cheek for the mule. Anyway, um, so that's the three post-zygotic mechanisms. They all stop one of those three things that it means to become a species, right? This last one is the third point. Your kids have to have kids of their own someday or be able to do it. So these are pictures here showing these various things. Now what I did is I cut the picture in half and I enlarged it. You can see these much better on your screen, but if you look here, this is ecological or habitat isolation. So you have two snakes that look remarkably alike. One is a sea snake, the other one's in a desert. They're not meeting each other. But you can see the similarity there. Here again are two badgers, and this is temporal isolation. So badger one might want to mate in May, Badger species number two might not do that until October. Here's our behavioral isolation. These birds are called blue-footed boobies. If you actually enlarge a picture here on your computer at home, you'll see their, their uh, I don't know what these birds have, they're like flippers or, or whatever, they're paddlers. Their feet are basically the color blue. And what happens is the male does the crazy dance and calls out, and the female watches and goes, oh, wow, he's... He's so dreamy, I'm going to mate with him. But again, only she recognizes that. The other birds, like the seagulls and the loons and the puffins, they're all watching this guy going, like, he is right out of his mind. Right? So that's behavioral. Here's our two snails here, that are two whelks, I should say. Same word as snails. And the two whelks can't fit together to mate. So they've approached each other, but their shells do not interlock. All right? So this is mechanical isolation. They're trying to mate but it's not gonna happen. The pieces just don't fit. I had to split it up, so this is still one of our pre-zygotic. This is, it shows various types of urchins. Sea urchins are aquatic, just like our fish. Uh, they're mainly marine. If you remember from diversity, echinodermata, spiny skin. And so we've got several different urchins here, and of course they release their sperm into the water. Well. You know, the sperm from urchin A can only fertilize females that are also part of species A, right? Like we used, talked about with the fish diagram. And then we've got the three that 
talk about, or uh, that, sorry, that are post-zygotic. Reduced hybrid viability, here's a salamander here now, it's just kind of hatched or whatever, and they quickly die if it's, if it's not the two of the same species, and a salamander does hatch from the egg, it quickly dies after the fact. Um, I'll get to the horse and donkey and mule later. This is the one, hybrid breakdown is where the zygote is formed, but before it can really ever take place and start growing, it dies. Ooh. And here's our hybrid infertility, where basically we've got the horse and the donkey and the mule that is formed doesn't ever have, you know, become a parent itself. So in terms of speciation, there's two modes or patterns that we see when these branching events occur. All right. The first one is allopatric speciation. All right. So allopatric is the first one. In allopatric speciation, there's a geographical barrier of some sort. So there's some sort of geographic, a mountain range, a large river or, or body of water, or something is acting as a physical barrier. So there's a physical barrier in the geography. Right? Now, an easy way to remember this one think of it as wallopatric. That physical barrier acts like a wall. Now, of course, the W isn't there in the actual term, but if you think about it that way, allopatric and wallopatric, that wall is that mountain range. It is that that huge canyon. It is that raging river that separates these guys from these guys. We've got some good examples coming up in the pictures. And then there's sympatric. Sympatric speciation occurs in the same area. Right? Sim, same. Right? So the, the area isn't split apart by some sort of barrier. It has remained intact. But here what happens is the, the area is large enough where it offers a variety of different little resources or pockets or subhabitats where you can allow for different creatures to be formed and, and live in perfect harmony. All right? So we'll go over a couple of examples of each. We'll do allopatric first. So in this, what has happened here is, and we, we're seeing this now in areas that are getting warmer and warmer and warmer, you might have one large body of water to start out with. All right? And what you don't see under there is, is rot, you know, underneath the surface of the water, the lake or whatever, are that the land goes up and down. And as the water level drops in the lake, the land starts to poke through. And what you end up with is the land doing this. So land goes through here and maybe land goes through like this. Right? And so now our original lake as the water level is dropped, has formed three separate lakes. We have Lake A, Lake B, and Lake C now. And these lakes may have their own little differences. Maybe it's the amount of sunlight, maybe it's the amount of vegetation, it's the depth, it's the water temperature. Remember, there's so many different things that can determine what species of an area. And so now the lake that was all one lake at once has now evaporated and the water level is lowered. And now we see three different species of fish that are unique to each of the different lakes. All right. And here's another one. Here's a species of beetles. Now we can see here that the beetles are mainly brownish, beigeous in color, right? So they're a brown beige color. And perhaps water was diverted for a dam or whatever happened. There was some flooding that, you know, separated um, the habitat and, and, and basically broke it into two. So they shared a habitat, just like the lake was one habitat. The river comes through it. Now maybe the plants north of the river here are mainly green. So we can see over time, the beetles to hide from predators have, have adapted and through random mutation, they've developed this green color. South of the lake, the plants stayed the same. They were that brown beige color, like, you know, maybe like grasses and stuff like that. And so now these beetles, they stayed kind of the same. So now we have green beetles and beige beetles that if we put them together, they may not interbreed. They may not recognize each other as the same anymore. So that's 
that wall is, is like a wall of water. That river won't allow the beetles to cross. Here's an example. Um, this is two species of squirrel. And what biologists believe happened is they came from one species. And what happened was some of the squirrels got on this side of the canyon, others got on this side of the canyon. Now you see the sun, the sun is heating up this side of the canyon. So that's gonna affect the plant life there, it's gonna affect the temperature there, right? Uh, the, the light, you know, the amount of light each side receives is different. This side is in shadow most of the day. And so what happens is this side's a little bit cooler and that results in different plants and different things going to there. And the two squirrels, even they, the, though they look you know, remarkably alike, they have little differences that allow them to cope into this little mini environment or cope within this little mini environment. The Colorado River, which runs through the Grand Canyon, is that wall. It's that geogra geographical barrier that separates the two. Now, sympatric speciation... If we think about our lake, with sympatric, and remember sympatric means same. So if we think about that lake, that lake now is huge, right? Like our Great Lakes. And in one area over here, we might have reeds. Another area over here, there's lots of algae. I should probably do that in green. But there's lots of algae over here, lots of reeds over here, and maybe over here there's a different type of plant like bushes growing on this edge of the lake, right? And so what we see is within the large habitat, there are many habitats. So we see here there's three different fish. We have the flat fish, the largest ones, and the more streamlined ones, and then the medium types. And so fish type A, they might enjoy eating the algae that you know, we're here in the sun-exposed area, this part of the lake. B might eat on something like the exposed roots of this bush, whatever it happens to be. But they're found in this area of the lake. And C eats maybe the insects that eat the reeds over here. So within the same habitat, right, we have a large enough area with different little micro habitats in there that allow different species to survive so when maybe a was the only one there but then some of them you know all the algae was getting eaten so some of them by random mutation started to try to eat you know the berries of the bushes or whatever was the roots of the bushes and so they were able to do that now there's enough for both and then one of these split and some of them decided you know what the insects that are over here near the cattails they're awesome i like those and so they developed the traits that allow them to catch those insects so and, and that's the thing. Usually the habitat has to be very large, like a very large lake. You wouldn't see this in a, in a backyard pond more than likely. And we're talking about our beetles. In our beetles, we have plants of both colors, right? So there's green plants that allow one beetle to hide, and maybe there's a lighter color. There's blue on here. I can't think of a blue plant offhand. But there might be a lighter colored beetle that hides on the birch trees, right? Think of that forest and the peppered moth, right? You might have light colored birch trees mixed in with dark colored trees. If that was a case where you had two different types of trees in that forest, both the light and dark peppered moth would have thrived, right? And here we just show some dinosaurs. Um, so you've got, or little dragons, whatever. You've got green ones and blue ones. And through sexual selection, what happens is even though they all live in the same area, the blues, they only kind of recognize and mate with the blues. The greens only recognize and mate with the greens. And so after a while, even though we're in the same area over time, the blues start to form their own population. The greens start to form their own population. And they become sexually isolated, which now means instead of having one population of dinosaur dragon, I've got the blue dragon. And that's a species different from the green dragon species. All right. And that's it. Another little meme there. Right? We talk about the finches in South America. They would have had all kinds of competition. Right, They would have had their own one little niche or role that they would have had to fulfill. They go to the Galapagos and boom, speciation just takes place all over the place because the Galapagos offered so many of those little environments for the birds to specialize within. Right, So an interesting little meme. Peter Griffin's still on a pandemic vacation. He'll be back sooner or later, I'm sure. Anyway, 
that's it. That's speciation. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. If there's any questions, make a comment in the comment section below this video or reach out to me through Edsby if you're one of my students. Anyway, hope you enjoyed it. Hope it made sense. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.